Um, as you already introduced, my name is uh, Gilbert Chauke. I'm from the Department of Trade and Industry. From the Department of Trade and Industry, I'm stationed within a division that is known as IDAT, which abbreviates Incentive uh, Development and Ad Administration. And within that particular division, I'm stationed in the, in the unit that is uh, known as Strategic Partnerships and Customer Care. What is our core business as strategic uh, partnerships and customer care? One of our core business is mainly to do uh, the promotion of our you know, products and services, particularly our incentives, with the view of trying to increase the uptake of our products. I'm just going to do a brief presentation on one of the unique programs that we have, which is your manufacturing competitiveness uh, enhancement, enhancement program. One of the core objectives of, of the program is mainly to encourage enterprises to upgrade their production facilities, processes, products, and upskill uh, uh, the workers. And uh, more importantly, to provide support for the manufacturing sector in order to maximize output and employment. So this particular program is uh, basically designed to ensure that it you know, contributes towards fast-tracking the issue of uh, uh, job creation. Uh, the, second, uh, the third bullet there, as you can see, one of the objectives is to expand a, a existing IDC, distressed funding facility to SMA, uh, SMMEs, and to reduce the cost of capital for distressed enterprises, and also to reduce the price of working capital for exports and businesses participating in government infrastructure program. And uh, lastly, uh, to strengthen the responsiveness of available incentive schemes to the current uh, economic challenges. Available incentive scheme this particular scheme is mainly designed to support uh, uh, entities that are already existing, that are operational, those that want to do uh, expansion, those that want to expand their production facilities. Now let's quickly look at the MCEP uh, benefits. What are the core benefits of this particular program? As you can see, the program it is basically a non-taxable uh, uh, grant calculated at a, a percentage of manufacturing value added, we call it MVA, and it is kept as follows, as you can see the percentage is there. Uh, basically we look at manufacturing value add assets is more than or is larger than 200 million, then you can qualify for 7%. If it's, uh, uh, it's between 30 million and uh, uh, 200 million, you can qualify for 10% or the enterprise, uh, the entity can qualify for 10%. Uh, 5 million and uh, uh, 30 million, you can qualify for 12, 15, which is for uh, uh, assets below, below uh, 5 million. And as you can see, my last bulletin there, we're saying that uh, the grant is more favorable to SMMEs. If you don't understand what we mean by that, you need to look at the breakdown of these particular percentages. You'll realize that the last bulletin, we're saying that for uh, enterprises with assets below 5 million, then they can be able to qualify for 15% for of their uh, manufacturing uh, value add. Well, how do we then uh, calculate the manufacturing value add? This is the formula that uh, the Department of Trade and Industry uses to calculate the manufacturing value add. As you can see there, it's turnover, uh, less uh, value of imported goods, uh, other goods, uh, sales of uh, other goods, and uh, less material uh, uh, input cost then it's equal to manuf manufacturing value add. I know that the formula is a bit technical, it's just unfortunate. I cannot dwell much into explaining the technicalities of the formula. But however, in my department, we have a specific unit that, that is assigned to uh, manage this particular program. So if you want more information on how uh, this particular formula works, you can give me a call, then I can be able to link you with the people who understand uh, deeply the, the, uh, the technicalities of this particular program. Now let's quickly look at uh, the structure of the uh, MCEP uh, program. As you can see, the, the program is divided into two components. The first component is the production incentive uh, uh, grant, which is mainly uh, managed by the Department of Trade and Industry, IDAT, our division. As you can see, the first component in di is divided into five categories. Your capital investment, green technology, uh, enterprise uh, level uh, competitiveness and improvement, feasibility studies, cluster competitiveness. And the second component is uh, the loan facility, which is mainly managed by uh, ITC. And the last, I'm not going to read everything there, as you can see, uh, the last component consists of, 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 uh, of three uh, subcategories. Now let's quickly... Uh, do the breakdown of the first component. 
like I've indicated, the first category is capital investment. This is the nature of, 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 of that particular category. It is a co-sharing grant uh, uh, towards investment in upgrading capital equipment and expansion of uh, productive capacity. And uh, the co-sharing grant is between 30%, 40%, and 50% of the investment. And the maximum grant that you can qualify for, it is a five, uh, uh, 50 million. And we're saying that an entity can actually also qualify for additional bonus, uh, uh, for additional bonus, and that is provided that if they procure at least 50 percent in the value of their total project budget, uh, machinery and equipment tooling man uh, and, and tooling manufactured in, 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 in South Africa. So if you are going to procure a, a machinery and tools manufactured locally, then an enterprise stands the chance of qualifying for additional 10% uh, bonus. The Green Technology Program, in terms of its benefit, it doesn't differ much from the first uh, category that I, I just presented. As you can see, still the cost sharing grant between 30, 40, and 50, you still will qualify for, uh, for additional 10%, and also it is still the, uh, in terms of uh, the maximum, it's still 50 million there of the grant that you can qualify for. Enterprise level competitiveness grant, it's a cost sharing grant towards investment in the adoption of uh, world-class uh, manufacturing uh, practices such as Lean Production System, Six Sigma, uh, etc. And adoption and accreditation of conformity and quality standards such as your ISO, improve, uh, improved packaging design, acquisition of IT software systems, project specific skills upgrading and, and, and so on. And in terms of the cost sharing, it's uh, 50%, 50, it's between 50 uh, to, to 70% of the project, of the total project cost. The feasibility studies grant, it's a co-sharing grant, and uh, your qual uh, qualifying costs will include engineering design costs and other relevant co consulting fees, and it's a co-sharing grant uh, between uh, 50 and 70 uh, percent of the total project cost. A cluster incentive program, which uh, my colleague here has just uh, briefly talked about it, it's a co-sharing grant developed to, to support cluster initiatives aimed at improving competitiveness, innovation, and access to new markets, and examples, as you can see there, we're saying that initiatives that can be funded include uh, shared infrastructure, such as sector technology development center, market research, international advertising, and uh, uh, publicity costs, etc. And we're saying that access will be subject to a defined minimum number of enterprises, and uh, the cost sharing will be 80-20 day of qualifying a uh, project, project costs. The last component uh, that I've talked about, it is uh, uh, the loan facility which is managed by the, uh, by the IDC. And we're saying that it's financed to cover working capital requirements from date of, uh, date of uh, receipt of order to dispatch, the custom, uh, to, dispatch to customer, including uh, raw material, packaging and transport costs or transportation costs, a date of dispatch of goods to date, when seller realizes the proceeds of sale, and we're saying that the finance is fixed at uh, 6%. We also have a component there, a distressed uh, concessionary uh, fund. We're saying that preferential interest rate facility for any distressed manufacturer, and also, as you can see there, uh, the finance is also fixed at 6%. And lastly, we have the niche funding, which uh, is designed to support strategic projects proposed by the IDC and the DTI uh, 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 sector desk. For one to be able to qualify for the program, there's a lot of uh, qualifying criteria that entities will have to, uh, to, to meet so that uh, for them to be able to qualify for the program. But because of the issue of time, I've tried to only indicate uh, 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 three, uh, three areas there. As you can see, firstly, you must be a South African uh, registered entity. More than anything else, the program it's designed to, uh, uh, to contribute towards accelerating the issue of uh, employment uh, development. Uh, as you can see, the projects are required to sustain existing employment levels at the date of application for the duration of their participation in the MSEP. So it is important to, uh, 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 to note that particular element. The program is designed to last for six years, and the enterprises are required to renew their participation at the end of every two years. We're saying that in terms of a BEE, this is a requirement. We're saying applicants should achieve at least level four of BEE in terms of uh, the uh, code of uh, good practice. And uh, applicants who are not able to comply uh, uh, to this particular criteria, they need to provide at least a motivation to say 
uh, uh, what is it that they are going to put in place to ensure that at the end of the day they are able to comply to this particular requirement. I think uh, that was my quick uh, presentation. My name is JC Kralen. Um I'm giving you a private sector perspective, but first, we are part of the PDNA group. Sorry, Chris. Um, <laughs> consulting engineering firm, 25 year experience. We've got a few offices in Africa and I think in Mos um, Mauritius as well. We've about 450 people, but that's not really where I am. They are our holding company. We are Econogistics. We are a subsidiary of uh, PDNA Holdings. And <coughs> what we basically do is we take a concept and we make a project. Um, and, you know, due respect to all the banks, but they don't fund that. So, Econogistics, just a bit of background. We do um, corridor and corridor development work. We've done uh, transport infrastructure work, logistics infrastructure work logistics infrastructure studies and then local and regional economic development projects. Just more about ourselves and specifically on the right hand side which is important which is where we've applied the CPFP funding. Um, let's start on the left. We do corridor on corridor development work. There's some examples of the work we've done. We do local and regional economic development. We do the development of potential logistics and transport infrastructure which is an important word that potential. Because you have to identify the project, do a bit of pre-feasibility work, and then apply for the funding. Because you can't just sell a concept. Mautiz Industrial Park CPFP project, the Tumep Logistics Precinct CPFP project. We've got some experience, and I can carry on. Okay, Mautiz, um, that is in Tate, Mozambique. Um, we identified the market for industrial park to supply those mining companies. There's a massive boom in terms of exploration. Uh, we applied to it. We did a bit of research. We did the pre-feasibility. We applied for CPFP funding for this study. The study took four months to complete, in which we time we had to deal with James Coco and Ronaldo and, and the guys from the CPFP office. Um, and it was very pleasant, I must say. Due to the outcome of the study, we've, ex we've been able to secure an investor and a financier to develop the park in Tate. We've actually applied for funding just to go a bit further twice um, for park specific. One was the one in Tumep, but that one I'm not going to go into de too much detail now. Now, <coughs> the evaluation process was very quick and swift. They normally apply, you normally submit your application about a month before the sitting takes place so they can review the documentation before the committee sits. Um, you have to define your, your proposal well. You have to demonstrate what the benefit are to South African companies and you have to prove that you know, there's a real business case. We did a bit of upfront work in both cases and we've just applied for more funding for another project because we, um, we did the pre-feasibility and we realized there's an opportunity. The administration of these programs, um, very well administered. You have to submit obviously detailed uh, timesheets, expenditure sheets, those type of things. Good housekeeping is, is part of every good consulting firm, so that's not a big problem. Um, claims were handled efficiently. Once we've submitted the claims, they were always paid on time and, and quite diligently. Um, reporting is very important with uh, CPFP. You have to report at the milestones. Uh, even afterwards, if you are requested to report um, I mean, we closed out the, the, the MOT study quite a while ago and still to today, you know, we sometimes just give feedback to, to DTI in terms of the progress with the actual implementations of the project. Just some background why TET, why we did the project. I know you say we shouldn't focus on the projects. But it's one of the fastest growing areas in terms of coal. Um, Rio Tinto, Vale, there's a whole lot of big companies that have moved in there. The Vale has invested 1.5 billion US dollars into the Maotis concession um, and there's the Benga and Zambezi concessions. Um, what we also realized is not only the mines there, and that's sometimes what you must look at the projects. If you sp just focus on one sector, you tend to get a skewed picture as well. An industrial park like this that we're proposing, they will also serve the tobacco industry. And there's a big one in, the, in, Mo in Tet as well. There's also power stations going up, so South African companies can go and supply on the power stations. There's the uh, new bridges that's being built, there's new roads, there's hydroelectric dams. There's a lot of opportunity there, hence the focus on TET. It's still the fastest growing area in, in Mozambique, but there's a lot of challenges. 
And part of the study was obviously to identify those challenges and see how we can overcome them. And there is open other opportunities in TED specifically, not related specific to what we're doing, but there's for South African companies identified in the study. There's opportunities in industrial parks, retail, accommodation, tourism, private hospitals, transport, and I can go on. Just an important point there. It's one of the focus areas of the Mozambique government to develop industrial parks in that region. There's five big or six big poles or areas that they've identified and TET was one of them. Hence we got support from the Mozambican government. You see that we actually got CPI involved, the Ministry of Planning and Development, the administrators. It is quite a cumbersome political process but we got the, the, the support. What's the market of our park? The Maltese Industrial Park will service logistics. It will have a logistics hub, logistics service providers from South Africa, distribution center, consolidation and deconsolidation centers, and even a truck stop facility. Equipment suppliers, important for the capital side of it, mining, electrical transport, um, aftermarket spares will be able to be hosted in this park and will probably invest in this park in, in well, I'll get to, the, to, to who's the tenants currently. We'll have centralized facilities because that attracts people to the park. We have secured land and all of that, so <coughs> you don't need to worry to set up your ICT infrastructure, security, fences, get land, it's all in the park. Easy for South African companies now to go and settle in debt and service the mining industry there. We had meetings with several stakeholders um, in the industries and we've secured in the feasibility phase, 60% tenants for the, for, the, for the first phase development. The first phase development is 100,000 square meters on the roof. Now that's a lot of tenants from South Africa going to Mozambique. And there's the sectors from which they, they will be coming. Okay, what's the socioeconomic impact of this? There's job creation, there's impact on regional GDP, there's skills and training facilities that's going to be going in there. Local economic development will be stimulated and foreign direct investment. We've already made a quite a big impact through the study. There's just the artist impression of the, the development we're going to do. Again, it's in support of, the, of all the sectors in that region. There's a lot of problems in TED, like I mentioned quickly. You can't access land. A lot of guys setting up in TED at this stage are taking big risks. If they go on it in their own. A lot of people get land from the local governor knowing that that land is on, on mining uh, reserves and concessioned land. So you will set up your business and someone's going to pay you market value when they move you when they want to start mining where your company is. So well, that's one of the challenges and why this park is such an important thing. It also gives South African companies a so solid base from where they can start operating into Mo northern Mozambique. Okay, and that's like I said, that's the type of businesses that that's still opportunities there for people to go and explore. Sorry, Net, uh, Netbank. <coughs> Standard Bank Group International has come on board as the funder. Atterbury Properties Holdings will be the developer. Um, the Mozambican government is involved. Obviously, Piri and I will do the engineering work. We took the 45% risk internally. Um, and hence, we now hope to make money out of selling our engineering uh, capabilities there. All right. Um, Imperial Logistics Africa will take the heat lease for the park. They have come in on board, first of all, as the main investor. They will in invest in the sense that they will supply the security on the heat lease and they will sublease facilities to the tenants. The role of uh, the South African government, uh, obviously the DTI and CPFP funded the project for us. The main objective of the program was to facilitate the study um, that could lead to the export of, of, of all these services and goods. The secondary objective of the program was to attract higher levels of domestic and foreign investment. Um, and obviously all the SADC and, and all those targets were also met. I'm not going to go into detail, there's a lot here. The feasibility study was done, the financial model was developed, that's part of our study was to develop a financial model with 20-year projections. In other words, developing a bankable business case for an investor. <laughs> you, that's part of the feasibility process. If you don't do that, you're, it's just another paper that's going to lie in file 13. We've appointed a technical team. Preliminary conception layouts and drawings have been done. And the shareholders' agreements have been signed by all. A uh, project has been approved by CPI. The land is secured. And we are soon to start with commencement with the development company 
to develop the park. The, final, the share of those agreements have been finalized. Bulk services is still a bit of a challenge, but the Mozambicans have signed that they will assist in supporting on that. Now, subject to our study on the industrial park, there was an opportunity identified because of doing business in Mozambique is so difficult. And BPEC then um, drafted an application to the SSAS fund to establish a, um, a trade facilitation center in Mozambique, specifically northern Mozambique, to allow South African companies to interact more proactively and, and, and easily with their counterparts in Mozambique. We were one of the companies that uh, submitted uh, proposals to this and we were appointed. We also then, in, 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 in the process, worked with DTI as the service provider to BPEC. So I can also talk about the funding from SSAS. Um, the proposals uh, was written to BPEC. BPEC uh, selected a, uh, a service provider and obviously it's a co-funding model for the service provider from BPEC and the DTI. You know, administratively, it works in the sense that once Rulof is happy with our product, he then tells DTI and they, he pays us his part and DTI paid us their part. And we did the study for the establishment of a trade facilitation center in Mozambique. Everything worked wonderfully. The only delay was with Rulof. DTI was very quick. <laughs> Not really. No. no. The program was administered excellently and um, we had to report obviously as well on milestones just with the, as with the CPFP program. BPEC identified the opportunity to, to set up a trade facilitation center. And one of the aims I think is to start to uh, latch on to these big projects as well. In, uh, that we are doing in all over Africa and, and Rulof has a dream of replicating these in Africa, these trade facilitation centers. But now he's got a base as well with our Motis industrial parks. Our methodology we used, we used, uh, we looked at the business opportunities in TET, the business environment in TET, what makes it easy or difficult to go and work in those, in those conditions, except for the temperature. Let's not talk about the temperature there. We obviously gauge the requirements from the South African companies to go and do business there. And we try to match that and do a uh, costing implementation plan for establishing a trade facilitation center. Um, there's opportunities like with the industrial park in mining, energy, the residential, tourism, commercial, transport, all works. The same challenges exist as, was, as what uh, existed with the industrial park study. What I was talking about doing business in Mozambique, that part of the study, you had to go and have a look at what the Mozambicans expect of you to go and set up a business in Mozambique. We studied all of that. It's all available to BPEC now. The specific processes you have to follow to set up a business and actually start dealing in, in, in Mozambique. We made some recommendations and we identified certain challenges that we'll still have to address. Those challenges, a lot of them will be addressed in the actual implementation of a trade facilitation center. Stuff like the availability of documents, the language barriers, those type of things will be handled through a trade facilitation center. <coughs> we also had surveyed amongst the members of BPEC and some of the other export councils the need for this, because obviously there's no need for a trade facilitation center if nobody wants to go there and do business there. 76% of the companies have done or are doing business in Mozambique that we've interviewed. Okay, 43% of them are still at that stage when we did the study, we're still doing business in Mozambique. Um, and the companies came from those different export councils that we interviewed. 81% of companies said have and still are doing business in Mozambique. So it has, have and as and are. 90% of them are aware of projects. 95% of them responded that they are interested in doing business in Mozambique. So there's definitely a need for something like this. Um, and then I can carry on with all the results we found. So some of them had special conditions. If we go to Mozambique, we want a boardroom. We want a PA to be able to set up meetings for us before we get there, type of a virtual office setup. The facility is planned to be available to all South African companies that want to go do business there. Hence the South African flavor to it, SA Trade Facilitation Center. Um, and it will assist with all the problems experienced in doing business in Mozambique. We developed a costing and implementation plan based on the requirements from the companies that want to go there um, and we submitted the financial model as to how to roll it out. There's different models to run something like this. We've proposed fix, fixed funding models, fully funded by anchor, uh, mixed, mixed funding models where it's uh, private and public sector, 
fully funded by an anchor tenant or fully funded by government. The problem is funding an SA trade facilitation center fully by government. It actually loses its business flavor and you actually can't market it to someone else as well. By having a full-time anchor tenant, he's just going to lease it out to whoever, so it won't have an SA flavor. So you have to have that mix between government and private sector to promote South African business up there. Just what was the role of DERCO and how we see the role of DERCO going forward, the role of DTI. Obviously, this is suggestions that will have to be studied further in implementation process. And one has to secure, obviously, support from these two entities to set up a, a sort of an entity that has a South African flavor to it in Mozambique, not a company-specific flavor. Right. Um, the way forward we suggested was to finalize a funding application to do the phase two of the study, which is the actual implementation, to get the shareholders involved, to develop the model that it will run on, and then obviously implement it by getting staff on board, getting an office, it, those type of things. So that's just very quickly, that's not me, that's my boss, otherwise I would have been Portuguese. Um, that's my CEO, uh, Dr. Paulo Fernandes, his contact details if you've got questions on some of the type of projects we've done um, or our experiences with DTI, both on the CPFP, B, uh, SSIS or even with BPEC Interaction, you're welcome to contact us.